Now, in one of his talks this week, Jyotish encouraged us to take advantage of the natural beauty that is all around us here at Ananda Village, whether we live here or visit here. And I was very happy he did that because it's very easy for us to just concentrate on our little routines and just take the same trail to work every day and think about the projects we're doing and not pay attention to all kinds of other life that goes on all around us. And if you ever take a walk around the property, you will notice a great deal of beautiful oak trees that grow around here. Some of them are just really old, gorgeous, big trees and full of acorns. And because they're full of acorns, they support a very large population of squirrels. And in fact, this very morning, Devarshi and I watched a little visitor in our garden just frolicking around. And they're very, very pretty. They're just bushy-tailed and gray and have a nice little um, white spot on their breast. And I was looking at the squirrel and thinking about all the different animals we have in the forest here that come and visit us. And then I thought about the squirrel's distant cousin that lives in India. Because we have a work in India, I was thinking the community in Pune probably has its own squirrels. And the Indian squirrel, which is a cousin of the American squirrel, looks pretty much like the squirrels we see here, bushy tail and, you know, perky little ears and beady little eyes, <laughs> except for one difference. On the back of the Indian squirrel, there are two beautiful long stripes. And like with anything in India, there is a story that goes with it. How the Indian squirrel, that used to look just like its American cousin, plain, got those beautiful stripes on its back. And the story goes back to the time of the great king Rama. And many of us have heard the story of the Ramayana, the great Indian epic. And if I were to tell you the entire story, we'll be here into the next week. So I'll just compress it. And basically the great king Rama, through some twists of fate, was exiled from his kingdom into the forest where he was joined by his beautiful, faithful wife, Sita, and his brother, Lakshman. And one day, Rama and Lakshman, the two brothers, went out hunting and left Sita behind. And while they were away, the great evil demon, Ravana, came over and stole Sita, took her out of the little hut that they shared in the forest and took her with him into his evil kingdom which was located in Sri Lanka across the ocean from the southern tip of India. And of course Rama and Lakshman came home to find Sita abducted and the rest of the Ramayana talks about how Rama then rescued Sika, Sita and brought her back by building this big, long bridge over the waters between the southern tip of India and the evil kingdom of Ravana. And how all these people, armies and armies of people and forest animals, helped him in the task. There were people who had, of course, evolved brains and they knew how to do all kinds of things. And then there was a great army of monkeys who were very clever and very quick and have very dexterous little hands and they could really help Rama a lot and they were led by the great Hanuman. And then there was a whole army of bears and the bears of course are very strong. And remember they were building this incredible project and the bears are very strong and they could bring big boulders and drop them on the seashore and build the foundation for this incredibly long bridge that Rama was building so that he could rescue Sita. And so all this activity was going on and there was this little squirrel, the cousin, the Indian cousin, was sitting in a tree and observing all this great commotion. He was thinking, wow, that is a long bridge. 
over some deep, deep waters. And look at all these creatures and people helping the great King Rama. And I want to help too. But what can I do? I got a pea-sized brain, <laughs> little bitty paws, and that's about it. <gasps> Wait a minute. I've got this bushy tail. I know what I'm going to do. There is this sandy bank, a little beach just off the shore of the sea. I'm going to run over there. I'm going to drag my tail through the sand, get it full of sand. And I'm going to run back and I'm going to shake the sand off my tail. And that will help the great Lord Rama build his bridge. The few grains of sh sand that I'm going to shake off my tail. Now, if this was an American squirrel, who are very, very practical, all you see them all day long doing is just storing acorns for the hard times. <laughs> he would have said, you're going to do what? Have you seen the size of this project? Do you really think your few little grains of sand are going to make any difference whatsoever? He's got people who know what they're doing working for him, you know? But it was not the American squirrel. It was the Indian squirrel. And Indian squirrels don't let, quote unquote, practicality get in the way of their service to the guru. And so the little squirrel ran to the beach and rolled in the sand and ran back and shook off his tail. And then he got all his friends and the family and the relatives. And before you know, there was a great army of little squirrels probably getting underfoot, <laughs> shaking their little tails. And by the end of the day, the great Lord Rama was so pleased with the little squirrel that he picked him up on his hand and he stroked his little back. And that's how the squirrel got his stripes, from the touch of divine fingers from Lord Rama. That's the story <laughs> of his stripes. Now, like with any great Indian epic, the story is a deep allegory. It's not really a story about some housewife being abducted <laughs> and then the husband, you know, going after the bad guy in revenge. The story is really about Sita, which represents the individual soul that is held in captivity by the demonic forces of Maya. And how God, in the form of the guru, comes down to this earth to rescue that soul, to build the bridge between the ordinary human consciousness and his divine kingdom so that we may all come back into union with God. And that story repeats itself time after time after time through all the history of mankind. And in our own times, of course, we, have, we see the great Yogananda come down to earth with the teachings to build the bridge in our own consciousness so that we may be united with God and also to offer the same help, to offer the same rescue to everyone who would receive it in the world. And it's a great, great, big worldwide mission, huge project, as you say. And he has all kinds of people helping him. And I'm looking around here, I've been with Ananda for some years and I'm amazed at the talent that he has drawn to help him in this mission. We have people who know how to plant a garden so that we all can eat food. We know people who know how to build a community so that we can all live together and help each other and build temples and raise children and build schools and, and teach classes and, and they know HTML. And get this, they all know how to meditate. They're really, really good at what they do. And then there is me, pea-sized brain, <laughs> ratty little tail, used to be bushy, not anymore. <laughs> and you think about it, 
what can I do? Because I really want to be a part of this great work that's happening. What can I do? Well, I know what I can do. I can roll out in the sand, pick up a few grains of sand, and run over to where the work is happening and shake it off. And is this going to build a bridge? I don't know, because I ain't done yet. <laughs> Does it look kind of pathetic? Maybe. But you want to know something? I can do this all day long, day in and day out, year in and year out, until my breath leaves my body, either in samadhi or in death, whichever comes first, <laughs> in the hopes that at the end of it, my guru will take me up in his arms and he'll say, well done. Well done, little squirrel. There was a disciple of Yogananda's, and I see in all your eyes here that I am not alone. There was a disciple of Yogananda's that we read about in the, autobi in the New Path, Swamiji's autobiography. It's a story that is probably seared in all of our brains who have ever read the story. If you haven't read it, please do. Please read the book. It will change your life. The story of the disciple who was spastic. Now, there's probably a proper medical term for his condition, but no matter what the term was, his condition was severe, according to Swamiji. The fellow could barely speak. He would stammer, and he couldn't walk without props. And Swamiji said that would, people actually had a difficult time watching him because it was so painful. He was an usher in one of Master's churches. And when it came time to take up the collection, he'd clutch the backs of the chairs to be able to make it down the aisle. And of course, as we all know, the story goes that one day Master was talking with his disciples, and he said, this fellow is going to be freed in this lifetime. And everybody said, oh? Huh? And Master said, yes, God is very pleased with his devotion. And somebody said, well, gee, that must be a pretty simple devotion, knowing the fellow. And of course, we all know the answer, and that's what's seared in my brain. Oh yes, Master said, and that's the kind that God loves the best. And when we think about that story, we think of it in terms of devotion. But there is more to it than that. Read it carefully. That fellow, he could have stayed home, you know? He could have looked at the scope of Master's work and say the great Yogananda came to bring the teachings that will change the course of civilization in our age. He has all kinds of very bright people working for him. They write books, they print lessons, they build churches, they're great speakers, and I can't even walk. I think maybe I'll stay home. But he didn't. He was an usher in one of the churches, and he clutched the backs of the chairs to get his job done. And if people had a problem looking at him, then that was their problem. It wasn't his problem. In fact, he didn't have a problem. <laughs> a guy was going to find God, probably has by now. And so, like the disciple, like the little Indian squirrel, let us not let anything deter us from serving in whatever way we can from serving our great guru, from serving this work. Everyone has something to contribute. Everyone has something to bring to the table or the project. All we need to do is be willing to do it. Now then, as I was talking earlier, there is a great deal of talent here at Ananda that I have observed over the years, and it's just getting brighter and brighter and brighter. 
and the work that we have been blessed to help with is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And the more I think about it, the more fishy it seems. <laughs> because frankly, it just doesn't add up. You look at ourselves, I mean, we're a fairly bright group of people, but kind of sort of ratty, you know? <laughs> Sometimes Devershi and I would look at each other and we would be talking about our day at work and then we would look at each other and we just start laughing. <laughs> and really, and laughing and laughing because we really look kind of sort of scruffy, you know? And then you think about Swami Kriyananda, how is this humanly possible for one person working through one body that's not getting any younger, that has had every medical condition that you can find in the book, to know so much and to do so much in the last year alone. How is this possible? How is this possible for us to reach out to all the far corners of the world, to build a community in India, to do all the things that we're doing? What, you, you start thinking that there is probably another factor <laughs> in the picture. <laughs> and in fact, there is. And I will read it, the factor, the mysterious factor that we're talking about, of course, is expressed so beautifully by Swamiji in his vows of complete renunciation. Again, this evening, we're going to have a vow ceremony. And whatever vow we ever take as a disciple of this work, the vow that I'm about to read applies to everyone in whatever degree we're able to manifest it. I will feel that not only the fruit of my labor, but the labor itself is only thine. Act through me always, Lord, to accomplish your design. And that is the great secret behind Ananda's work, behind Master's work. There is a beautiful movie that we saw a few months ago with Swami Kriyananda when he was here in America. It's called Green Pastures. It's an old Hollywood classic. It was made in the 30s and been digitally remastered recently. Please watch it if you get a chance. It has a cast of all African Americans, and it portrays the story of the Old Testament through the eyes of black people in the Deep South. And one of the most touching scenes there is when God, who had the name the Lord in the movie, of course it's done with a beautiful black accent, which I will mangle, so I won't even try. <laughs> And the Lord looks down on earth and he sees that the tribe of Israel has been enslaved by the uh, Egyptian king and he wants to help those people, his people. And so he calls to him a council of the old uh, Jewish uh, patriarchs, Hebrew patriarchs that had left the earth and are now living in heaven with God, and he, he calls them to his office. He says, an office. And these three very dignified, bearded gentlemen came over, Jacob, Isaac, and somebody else. <laughs> and he says, <coughs> boys, boys, my children down there, they're really suffering, and I would like to lead them out of captivity, but we need a leader. Who would you recommend? And they say, Lord, do you want the holiest or the brainiest? <laughs> and the Lord says, ah, I want the holiest. I'll make them brainy. <laughs> and there is a deep, deep spiritual teaching in that. Because all God wants us to do is to offer ourselves sincerely in service and devotion. And he'll build the bridge. He will give us what it takes to attain the self-realization. He will give us what it takes to be useful in our service to him. He'll give us what it takes 
to call other people into this wonderful family. Who is building that bridge? God is building that bridge. I think if of the many miracles of Swami Kriyananda's life and example, the most significant for me is something that could be called his mantra. I call it his mantra. He doesn't. I call it his mantra. And that is, I cannot do it, but Master can. I would like to invite Maitri to come and sing with me a poem by Yogananda called, I have nothing to offer thee. The words are his, the music was written by one of the devotees. Please join me as you wish. And as we sing it together, feel that we are singing to our guru, to the masters, to God, and complete the most sincere offering of ourselves in their service. and my speech for 